مساء الخير وأسعد الله مساءكم بكل خير. The life of the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was one of the first and most enduring topics upon which Muslims studied, reflected, and wrote. From the time of the companions in the first uh, century of Islam and the seventh century of the Common Era, and throughout every generation thereafter until today, uh, uh, Muslims have returned to the Prophet's life in reverence, the preservation of his memory, and as a source of guidance. Uh, and it's in this spirit of collective uh, inquiry that we gather here today uh, on the week of the Prophet's birth uh, to talk about this legacy. My name is Maurice Pomerantz, and as director of the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, it is my profound honor and privilege to introduce to you Professor Joel Hayward, who currently serves as Professor of Strategic Thought at the Rabdan Academy here uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, he's held esteemed roles, such as Director of the Institute for International and Civil Security at Khalifa University, uh, and he's also been the Head of Air Power Studies at King's Col College London. Professor Hayward combines an interest in strategic studies and Islamic ethics. And he is surely a prominent academic. Uh, Kirkus Reviews stated of, uh, of him, he's an undeniably one of academia's most visible Muslims. And his mention in the 2023 edition of the Muslim 500, uh, I'm assuming that's the 500 most prominent Muslims, identified his particular talents at bringing classical Islamic knowledge and methodologies uh, uh, in order to make innovative yet carefully reasoned sense of complex historical issues. He's a fellow of both the Royal Society of Arts and the Royal Historical Society. And as you can see, uh, Professor Hayward has written numerous books that provide ample witness to a life of active scholarship, including, and I think, uh, Warfare in the Quran in 2012, War is Deceit in 2017 at Harb Khida, <laughs> Arabic, and uh, The Leadership of Muhammad, which uh, won the best international nonfiction book uh, at the 2021 Sharjah International uh, Book Awards. And he has a new book out in 2023 entitled The Warrior Prophet, Muhammad and War. Professor Hayward has also published poetry and short stories and is currently working on a book on the ecological history of war from the ancient times to the, I, I'm imagining the present. In addition uh, to his scholarship, Professor Hayward has also provided strategic advice to political and military leaders um, he's even served as tutor to His Royal Highness uh, Prince William. His talk today, entitled Researching the Leadership of the Prophet Muhammad, Issues of Truth, Objectivity, and Bias, uh, promises to build and I think mostly reflect on these topics. Uh, so we are very happy to welcome here to the, uh, him here to the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute tonight. And Tafadl, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a tremendous honor to, to be here at New York University, Abu Dhabi. Um, I, I came earlier this afternoon and gave a lecture to some students from the Muslim Association, and it was a terribly uh, enjoyable experience. I, I um, felt gratified. Uh, I felt rewarded, and it reminded me why I became an academic in the first place almost 30 years ago. Um, I've spent my career studying leaders, studying conflict, studying politics, studying war, and it, somewhere along the way, I, I found myself studying the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and getting kind of hooked on him. And that led me uh, from a previous religion into Islam. 
And since I became a Muslim, I've written mostly on Islam. And I, I write on it, I think, because of my affection for the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. But it's that very affection that I have for him that creates a kind of a tension within me. Because I have a method as a historian that's based around objectivity, which is based around the need to step back from our biases. And biases can be positive as well as negative and to look at the past objectively. And so that's what I'm going to look at today, if, if, if that's OK, is how I go about researching the life of such an important historical figure, paying my religious deference to him, as well as retaining kind of a full criticality of thought and employing the method that comes with my discipline as a historian. So let's look at, actually, I'm not clicking forward for some reason. My, let's try this one. Thank you. Y you know, I, I, I became a Muslim after 9-11. Uh, I was working for a military general. And on 9-11 itself, he rang me and said, Joel, turn your TV on. And I turned it on to see that the first Twin Tower had been hit by an airplane and was shocked as to what had happened, obviously. And while we were talking on the phone, uh, the second plane hit the second building. And he said something that I remember. He said, well, now we know what's happened. It's terrorism, and it's these Muslims. And I said, General, how do you know it's Muslims? We don't know anything about this yet. And he said, well, who else would it be? You know, they're, they're the ones that do these things. I said, I've never heard you say such a thing. What makes you say that? He said, it's in their book. And I said, what, you mean in the Quran? He said, it's in the Quran. I said, what's in the Quran? He said, there's violence in the Quran. And I said to him, I, I, there's no violence in the Quran. He said to me, how do you know? You've never read it. And I was stung by that. I was a young academic, proud of the books I'd read over the years. I'd read Nietzsche, and I'd read Aristotle, and Plato, and Socrates. I'd read the scriptures of, uh, of my previous religion. And yet I'd never, ever once in my life picked up a copy of the Quran and opened it. And that embarrassed me, I guess. So I went that day and, well, the next day, in fact, the day after 9-11, and I got a copy of the Quran and started reading it. And it intrigued me that the prophets that I had grown up were there and were spoken of in exactly the same way. There was obviously a continuity of message, and yet it talked about one prophet that I'd never encountered and was speaking to him in the first person, like you. And I didn't know anything about this prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the next day, I went back to the bookshop, said to the same lady, have you got a biography of the prophet Muhammad? And she said, I do. And I said, is it by a Muslim? And she said, no, it's by a former Catholic nun called Karen Armstrong. But she's a very famous writer on religion. So I bought that book and started reading it. And I was terribly impressed by what I read. But here's the thing about it. That book adopted or used the same critical method that I used for making sense of the past. It relied on the seeking of critical distance, the interrogation of sources, all of those things as a historian that I could identify with. And yet the story of his life was highly positive. And, and I was, became immediately attached to this man. So I wanted to read more. And the second book I read was this one. It's called The Sealed Nectar. This is the best-selling book in English by a Muslim in the world. And it sells around 10 million copies a year. And I read it and was deeply disappointed. And I thought, Gosh, is that what Muslims believe about their prophet? Because it created a kind of a, a superman, someone that wasn't a real flesh and blood human that I could relate to, that, that I could, for example, want to follow. And I could see that the methodology was hagiographic. 
which is just a big fancy word of saying that it exalted him uncritically, the way you do a saint, which is where the word hagiography comes from, the depiction of a saint. So I could see that two approaches brought two different results, and that I, as a scholar, was drawn to the former and not to the latter. I don't want to follow somebody who's more than human. I want to follow a human that has challenges and faces them down, that has the same emotions and the same uh, responses that, that I'd like to have if I were only a better person. And so I kind of thought, I wonder what else is written about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, along the former line. And I can see that there's this other stuff that has less appeal to me. And so I began to read and read and read and read and read to the point where I felt I had a good grasp of his life. Uh, to the point where, as a scholar, I felt I wanted to say a few things about him myself. But I knew which approach I wanted to take. I'm a critical scholar. I like evidence. Evidence matters. Sources matter. Sources come in different shapes and sizes and different qualities. Good sources matter. And so I wanted, as a scholar, to bring my approach to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But this is my challenge. I want to write books about our Prophet, peace be upon him, that actually would be interesting to non-Muslims. Now, I can't do that if all I do is give theological explanations for everything that happened in his life. They can't access that. Someone from a different religion or no religion won't be able to make any sense of a claim that God did it. But if I can say, in this juncture, this is what the prophet was thinking, peace be upon him, these are the decisions he took, this is the consequences, then perhaps that might be a story that even non-Muslims could access and enjoy and gain meaning from. And I call that the historical, well, I don't, it is the name, the historical critical method of historical analysis, and that's what I kind of want to talk about. So I don't think that non-Muslims could gain anything if I'm just partisan and explain everything theologically, that simply God did it. But I also want to shed light uh, for Muslims. I want to, my books to actually make sense not just to non-Muslims, but to my Muslim readers. And I don't want to lose them along the way. I have to pay due deference to the prophet that I spent nearly 20 years trying to emulate out of the most profound fondness. And so there's a kind of a dilemma within myself as to how to do both at the same time, and even if one can do both at the same time. This is the method that I use. It's the method that every historian, I, I think, in the discipline of historian broadly follows. It came to us from the Enlightenment. Uh, the first part was a, a rejection of all supernatural explanations. And it's not necessary to disbelieve in God to take this position. It's simply saying, are there explanations based on human agency? Humans do things. Humans think things. Humans make decisions. Now, whether you believe that God empowers them to do so or not, that's up to you. But the two things aren't antithetical. But the Enlightenment and modernity brought about an attempt to kind of copy for the social sciences and the humanities the natural sciences. The natural sciences obviously have uh, observation, empirical evidence, what you see. The past can't be seen, it's gone. I told you I gave a lecture only an hour or so ago, it's gone. I can't experience any aspect of it apart from in my memory. It's gone. The past is continually gone. So there isn't anything to see, there's no empirical evidence. But with the best intention to cut, copy the scientific method, scholars said, well, we have something that we can see, which are the remnants or the fragments of the past. 
these things that are called sources. And that sources are the things that we can observe and try and understand the way a scientist would understand evidence. So this is how it works. The past broadly gives rise to myths. And whether it's myths about the Trojan War, or the myths of Viking conquest, the myths exist. But the past also leaves sources, which are those traces, scars on the ground of battlefields, um, iron arrowheads, documents, uh, people's memories. These are sources. And historians use those sources to challenge the myths for a purpose, to produce objective, explanatory interpretations that we call history. And so this is the method that I really like and I've been trying to follow for 30 years. And it's allowed me to understand the past with a sense of confidence and certainty. And that's rather nice. And sources come in two types. And this, when I come to the holy prophets, like peace be upon them, will have more relevance. You probably think, where's he going with this? There are what's called primary sources, and these are in a kind of hierarchy, the best kind. These are sources that originate from the participants in the events themselves, and are ideally created at the time of the events. These include things like documentary records, minutes of meetings, official reports, war diaries, gravestones. You go to a, gravestone, a graveyard and you see that a lot of people died in 1919. You think, OK, I get that. That's the influenza. Uh, that's a primary source. Registers of births and deaths and marriages, archaeological evidence and so on, primary sources. Diaries, journals, memoirs, things that are based on the human memory, the participants remembering what they did. Secondary sources, supposedly not so good. Sources originating from later observers, commentators and scholars. These are considered less reliable because they're based on hindsight. They're often created to serve the needs of later generations. And the interesting thing about sources is that primary sources are greatly favored over secondary sources. And it's said that those that come from the events themselves or close to the events in time are ordinarily considered to be the most reliable. And that those that are based on the human memory, which is malleable, it's fallible, are considered to be inferior to those created at the time. And this is created in the historical discipline, what's often called the cult of the archive. This is where the historian likes to spend his time sitting in an archive, pulling out documents from boxes, reading, reading, reading. What do the sources tell me? And this is all based on what's called objectivity. The objective selection of evidence, the interpretation of evidence, the employment of the evidence without a preference, which is a positive bias, or a prejudice. Supposedly, we're not supposed to allow our cultural, our religious, political, ethical biases to interfere in the way that we create history. And if there are two sides to a story, which we say there are, we're supposed to look at both sides and deal with them equal interrogative rigor and without preference from one side over the other. And as I mentioned, this is complicated for me because I am a committed Muslim. I love my religion and I follow my prophet. And I take it seriously. But I'm also a professional historian with a method. And that method is actually rather different to the way that history is is dealt with by religious people. Now, I mentioned sources. This, according to my method, is with our method, the historical discipline, is how we're supposed to look at sources. We're supposed to say, who wrote the sources? Why did they write them? For whom did they write them? Were they participants or observers? Because that's a big difference. If they were neither, what likelihood is there that they consulted reliable sources? 
what were their own assumptions, their values and biases, and so on. There are questions that we ask about sources demanding answers. Now, when we turn now to Islam and look at the life of our blessed prophet, peace be upon him, and by the way, this isn't a picture of him, but this is my favorite picture of warriors that uh, dated from that period. We often think about the battles, the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Uhud, as people fighting with swords and so on. The primary weapon of the Arabs of the seventh century was a long spear between 14 and 17 feet long. That's the weapon they used. And it shows again how much we misunderstand about these times. So what are the primary sources for the life of our blessed prophet, peace be upon him? The first primary source actually doesn't exist. The body of sources that we might want to see don't exist. What did the people around Arabia at the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, say about him? The answer is we haven't got a clue because we haven't found it. We have sources that date from close after his life, close after. But from in, within the Prophet's life, peace be upon him, we don't have any external commentators. Not Greeks, not Syrians, not Persians, no one. There are no accounts either from his enemies within Arabia. We don't have any non-Islamic Qurayshi sources telling us what the Quraysh tribe thought, for example, leading up to or following the Battle of Badr. We don't have another, ex another source for that. The alliances that we and he entered into, we don't have sources for that either. We simply don't have many sources from within his lifetime. Now, I'm not saying that's a terrible thing. I'm going to come back to this in comparison to other historical figures. And the few non-Islamic sources that date from just after his lifetime say almost nothing that we can build a historical analysis or narrative upon. They simply say that there was a guy in Arabia, they think he's a heretic, either from Christianity or Judaism, who's got a very strict monotheism and doesn't want men and women committing adultery. That's what those sources say about him from immediately after his lifetime. So there's not much that we can use in terms of external sources, non-Islamic sources, about the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Not much at all. But there is one rather amazing primary source that exists from within his lifetime. And that's the revelation that he brought that was later codified in book form, the Holy Quran. And the book is ancient. Historians went through a period in the mid 20th century of saying, oh, perhaps it's very late. It might date from 100 years after his life. It might date even from 150, 170 years after his life. But actually, we have pretty strong evidence that the book is contemporaneous. And we have, for example, the Birmingham Fragment, it's called, made a big, uh, got a lot of attention a few years ago when it was radiocarbon dated with an early date that even predated Islam. How can that happen? It's because you date the vellum that it's written on as opposed to the ink. The animal skin that it's written on just predates the Prophet's life, peace be upon him. And the range for the carbon dating goes from 568 to 645. He died, of course, in 632. It isn't the only one. There are other early copies that carbon dated to a very early period. And those of you who read Arabic, you can see that the, the words are essentially what you read in Quran today, uh, with tiny, 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 tiny variations that don't change much at all, often to do merely with spelling. And then, of course, in 1972, the famous Sanab uh, palimpsest uh, was discovered. 
And this has, uh, again, it's a very, very early uh, Quran. So there's lots of evidence uh, that this is an early book from his life, dealing with his life. The problem with it is, and I, I read Quran daily, I, I love my book, I try and understand it, as a Muslim has to, is that it seldom narrates the events of his life. It, for example, mentions hardly any places by name. It doesn't mention many battles by name, one or two. It mentions the Battle of Badr, for example. Um, it hardly mentions any people. There simply isn't much that we would call, call a traditional narrative. It's as though it was intended as a series of revelations to people who were living those things that didn't need to be told them. And so, as a historian, when I read Quran, I think, how do I get meaning from that about the life of the blessed prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? And the answer is, in Islamic science, well, a subset called Asbab an nuzul which means the occasions of the revelations that came down. And this is a kind of a science, well, one of the Islamic sciences that started around the year 1000. So 400 years after the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, people started saying, when did that ayah, that verse come? When was that uh, surah revealed? What is that verse talking about? And that now is a significant body of literature. And this is a most famous book. This one's from a scholar called uh, Al-Wahdi. It's from around the year 1000. And it's the kind of the father of all books of Asbab al -Nizur. All the other books draw upon it and have been inspired by it. But he only deals with uh, around, I don't know, less than 20% of the Quranic verses. And no books of Asbab al nizul cover all 6,200 verses. Just as it hasn't happened yet. So there are kind of gaps in it, and some of the books disagree amongst themselves. But where do they draw their knowledge that this is when a verse was revealed? The answer is they get it from the seerah of the prophet. The seerah means the life story of the prophet. Peace be upon him. And when you read that, uh, people say that the seerah is kind of hadiths arranged chronologically because it has chains of narrations and it says at this point God revealed this verse and at this point God revealed that verse all the way through the seerah. And the Asbab al nizul is drawing upon that. Uh, so we have a sort of a sense of uh, not certainty, but I guess kind of a confidence that we know when many of the verses came and why they came. And so when I try and reconstruct the life of our blessed prophet, peace be upon him, um, I look at those books of Esbab, Esbab and Nazul, and I'm reading them in the Sarah as well. Everything else is secondary. That seems to be the only primary source we have for the life of our blessed prophet, peace be upon him, is the Quran. Everything else is secondary. And you may say, oh, that sounds terrible. It sounds awfully weak. I, actually, most history is based on secondary sources. The life of Alexander the Great, the life of Julius Caesar, the life of Napoleon. Very few primary sources. And the further back you go, the far fewer there are. So this isn't an odd thing. And it doesn't damage our ability to reconstruct his life in a meaningful way. And the greatest body of sources that we have is called the Sira Magazi. And Maghazi means like the campaigns of the, the prophets, because that was a big fixation. In the early years of uh, Islam, is to explain conquests. Why did it happen? Lots of battles during the prophet's life, peace be upon him, lots of them after. Great expansion of Islam in the first hundred years. And so warfare was something of a fixation among the chroniclers. And so it has, the, even the Sarah, the prophet's life, has a heavy focus on that aspect of his life. And we can't say it wasn't important. He led 27 missions himself, 
27 military raids out of a total of around 80 in the decade after the Hijra. So this was a big activity for the early Islamic State. But the sources themselves are considered to be problematic. A famous historian called Patricia Corona uh, said this, in the case of Muhammad, peace be upon him, Muslim literary sources for his life only begin around 750 to 800 CE, some four or five generations after his death, and few Islamicists, that is the historians of Islam, assume them to be straightforward historical accounts. That's the view of the Sarah sources, that actually is history, they're not much good, and one of the reasons is because they postdate the Prophet, peace be upon him, by so long. A gap of 150 to 200 years. They call it the silent centuries because they say there are no sources. That it all happened as an explosion of intellectual activity about the year 830 to 850 when fiqh, when ahadith, ahadith when uh, sirah all suddenly appeared as this magnificent corpus of Islamic intellectualism. But actually, that's not quite true. And one of the things that gives me great comfort is the fact that even in the same century as the prophet's life, peace be upon him, people were recording the story of his life. There were nine letters written. I'll tell you what happened. There was a kind of a schism, a split between Muslims that were in uh, Mecca and al Medina, in the Hejaz, and the new authority in Sham and each declared themselves rival caliphates. And then what happened is uh, Abdul Malik ibn Ma'wan, the fifth Umayyad caliph, uh, made war physically against the Muslim polity in the Hejaz and went down and defeated them and killed the caliph, Abdullah ibn Masbeya. And his brother, the brother of that caliph, panicked and went to see the caliph in Damascus to plead for his life and was treated with great respect. And Abdul Malik said to Urwa, so tell me what you know about the prophet because you're connected to his family. And indeed, he was the nephew of the prophet's uh, 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 wife and the son of the daughter of Abu Bakr, the first caliph of Islam. So Urwa was well connected and knew he knew from his parents and his grandparents the story of the life of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And he told the Caliph in a series of letters. Now those letters haven't survived in their own distinct form, but they were recorded word for word by later chroniclers. And so we have them in a way secondhand, but complete. And so when people say there's this silent century, we're not quite sure that that's accurate. And Urwa told basically the entire story of his life. You'll recognize all these things as the key events. The vision in Jabal al-Nur, the initial resistance in Mecca, uh, the Hijra, the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Uhud, al-Khandaq, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, all the things that we know of as the essential elements of his story, Urwa told the caliph. And this formed the basis upon which all Sira has since been based on. And here you see all of the great writers of Sira. Urwa inspired uh, as Zuhri, who was the greatest of all the chroniclers, and everything really flows from him. And his students, Ibn Ishaq, wrote, of course, the famous Sirat, Rasulullah. And his students, uh, wrote other books. And you'll see a whole list of them here. The most famous, of course, are these ones. Ibn Hisham, al wakhidi and later, uh, after the 900, at tabri the famous chronicler of the history of the prophets and the kings, and the most famous tafsir, perhaps, uh, or one of the two in Islam, the tafsir at tabri but the other source that we draw upon when we chronicle the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a 
called the Ahadith. And the Sunni Muslims have six collections that they esteem above all others, which they call the Sitta, the six. And they date quite late. And this is one of the things that makes a lot of non-Muslim scholars a bit skeptical about Hadiths. You see that they date f f close to the end of the lives of the authors, so around 870, 890, 900 is when this corpus of Ahadith appeared. And there are a lot of Hadiths. In these six books, there are more than 20,000 distinct Hadiths. Bukhari alone has more than 8,000. These are remarkably detailed. If you think about the Prophet's prophethood lasting 20 years, he must have had at least three Hadiths recorded every single day of his prophethood to get to that 20,000. So this is a staggering collection of sayings of the Prophet. And these are called the Sahihain, they're the two that are held in greatest esteem, Al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Uh, they, they aren't equal, of course, to our holy book, the Quran. Nothing is. But apart from that, these are the books, our sources that we say are above others. So the Hadiths, what do I think of them? The answer is I have to admit they are a staggeringly impressive feat of human industry. And there aren't just those six. There are some other wonderful, wonderful books of Hadith that came before and after. And this happened in a very compressed period. And it's served as the basis of our understanding of Islam, and especially of jurisprudence, of fiqh, uh, since that time. And they deal with everything that happens in my life and your life as Muslims. From the time we wake up until the time we sleep, including our birth, including our death and burial, including our prayers. They cover everything, including how we fight if we go to war. But they're decontextualized. If you look at individual hadith, it will say that narrator A heard narrator B heard from narrator C that he was in the company of narrator D when the prophet, peace be upon him, said something. They don't tell you what was going on. They don't say, during the Battle of Uhud, at this moment in the battle, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did this or said that. In that sense, they're decontextualized. And for historians, context is everything. We need to know when something appears and why it appears, what its context is. And that's one of the reasons, but it's not the only reason why non-Muslim historians tend to be uh, strongly opposed to hadiths as historical sources. They hold them in condescension. They tend to find them, I'm generalizing, um, forgive me. Some historians say the hadith are effectively worthless as history. And you certainly couldn't build a narrative of the life of the Holy Prophet upon them. They don't, they don't have that quality. They insist that they rely on an impossible capacity for memorization that no humans have. Oral history is simply not that good. You can't pass something. And some hadiths, by the way, are more than 5,000 words long. Some are, that's like 10 pages. You think of hadiths as little discrete things like this. Some of them narrate whole events or whole discussions. Like, for example, the Adhan, the call to prayer, we know that someone said, well, should it be a bell? Well, no, we can't have a bell because that's what the Christians have. And then somebody replied, yeah, but there aren't any Christians here. So if we have it, why will it matter? Then someone said this and replied. And then someone said that. They are lengthy verbatim reports. And that makes non-Muslim scholars say, no, that's not feasible. No one could have remembered A said, B said, C said, D said. They also have contradictions. Some hadiths contradict other hadiths, and that's a fact. My view is that the contradictions are actually uh, well known, and we work around them. There aren't that many overall out of the collection. 
And the other accusation is that they represent present-centeredness, which means that when a caliph wanted to do something, he would say to the ulama, to one of his shiuch, Sheikh, give me a hadith from the Holy Prophet Muhammad that says such and such. Yes, sir. And out comes a hadith with the perfect chain, which is called the isnad, and the caliph is happy. And that's what they say. They say this is the problem with the ahadith. And they use one or two examples to prove the rule. For example, during the time of Abdul Malik bin Mawan, the fifth Umayyad caliph, he was forbidden from doing uh, the Hajj to Mecca. So he asked uh, one of his shiuch to give him a hadith allowing him to do it in Jerusalem at the Holy Mosque there. And that hadith, of course, exists. We know that. We've always known it. So there's a case of present centeredness. The problem is they take it to mean that the whole corpus is suspect because of one or two that we can readily identify as problematic, they must all be. And that doesn't make sense, but this is the view. And I don't agree with that. I, I use hadiths quite extensively in my scholarship, but I use them carefully. As I mentioned, I think it's a fabulous body of sources. Uh, but I know there are uh, hadiths that are daif, that are either weak or fraudulent to avoid. And after a while, you learn all these hadiths. You know which ones are. And you know which ones aren't, by the way. And I never try and guess context in a hadith if the hadith doesn't have context. If it says the prophet said such and such or did such and such, and we don't know when that occurred and why, I tend not to want to use it at all. Because I'm a historian, context is everything. How do I know the context of some, of some hadiths that aren't given in Bukhari or Muslim or An-Nasai or Tirmidhi. The answer is I go back to the Sirah, and the Sirah actually is arranged as a kind of a chronological set of hadiths. And you'll find a hadith that matches a hadith without context in Bukhari. And in the Sirah, the context is clear. It will say the hadith and narrate something. The narrators may be different. And the strength of the isnads, the chains in the, uh, the Sarah sources, are considered to be inferior to those in the hadith collections. That's a fact. But at least it gives me a context for when that hadith appeared, when the saying of the prophet was revealed. I can then go back into Bukhari and find it and say, aha, now I get it. I understand when it was revealed, uh, when it was spoken. So in my books on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I think around 25% of the sources uh, in my citations, my footnotes, are a hadith. And I've spent nearly 20 years daily reading hadiths. I know what I'm looking for. I know what to be careful of, I hope, inshallah. And I tell you, they are staggeringly impressive intellectual activity. The other sources I use, around 15% of my citations come from our holy book itself, around 40% from the books of Sierra, and around 20% from other sources. And that's, uh, I don't know if you can read it, it's very small, I apologize, but that's just a page of my end notes to kind of give you an example of what it looks. If there's purpose in keeping the hadith in Arabic, I do, for my readers. Uh, I have a mixture of, here on this page, uh, Ibn Hisham, Waqidi, Belethery. Uh, I have Bukhari, I have Muslim, I have an nasai and I have some other miscellaneous sources. So, I started by saying at the beginning that a historian says that sources that originate close to the time are considered more valuable to, than those that come much later. And that this is the criticism of non-Muslim scholars, is that there are these silent centuries to deal with. I actually don't hold this to be true, and I made this little chart, and I hope that it's not terribly, terribly tiny from the back. 
In the year 632, our beloved prophet, peace be upon him, passed away. That's the first peg in red, the year 632. Every 50 years is measured by a taller horizontal line. And every generation, meaning every 25 years, are the smaller blue pegs. Because it matters how many generations pass. Especially if you're talking about oral history. We're talking about the preservation of knowledge over generations. Actually, humans reproduced at a younger, at a, I'm not sure what the word is, greater rate. They had children at a younger age in the seventh century than they do now. I've actually fattened it out to 25 years. Mostly they're having children in later teenage years. And so there were more than five generations in a century. But to round it out comfortably, and I've, I've gone for 25 years. This is where the sources for the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, come. They come in this fashion, the light blue ones. You might not be able to see that so well, forgive me. The first one is Urwa, uh, Ibn Zubair. Uh, the next one is uh, Azuri, and then Ibn Ishaq. And then all of the ones in black are the ones that have survived, that we have copies of. The blue ones we don't have copies of, supposedly, at least in sole authored manuscripts or books under their name. And so historians look at that and they say, well, those ones that we do have the extent, which means surviving sources, oh, there is this period of 150 to 200 years. How awful. These Muslims have no grounds for stating com confidently the life of the Prophet. The sources post them by centuries. I don't find that actually to be true because we do have those books. For example, at Tabri in the year 900 still had copies of Zuhri. We don't have it now, but he had it, and he quoted from it directly. So we know what Zuhri said, or we know what Urwa said, because later writers quoted it directly. So I believe we can close that gap, actually, down to around 70 years from the time of the blessed prophet's death, peace be upon him, to the time when those first sources were written, of which we still have, recorded by other writers later. But they wrote them, and we have them. And just for your interest, if you go further to the most popular books of uh, both tafsir and chronicle in Islam amongst Muslims in the world today. It's Ibn Kathir's uh, Abidaya Wan Nahaya, the beginning and the end, and the Tafsir Ibn Kathir. These are the most read books uh, on Islam uh, and the history of Islam that Muslims read in the world. Those books date from 29 or 30 generations after the Prophet. And I limit myself to that first period as a scholar that I've clustered in black there, which all date within 12 generations, which is still an awful lot. 12 generations takes us back beyond the days of George III, if you are English, or if you're American, to the days of George Washington. It's a big gap. And were, if we weren't to have those later writers, telling us exactly what Zuhri said or uh, uh, Urwa, we might indeed have a problem. But they told us. Now, just to, to compare that, because I think there's a double standard going on here. If you look at the earliest extant sources for the life of Alexander the Great, it's from Diodorus Siculus, or the, the Diodorus from Sicily. Over 265 years after Alexander's death. He died in 323, of course. So you say, well, 265 years, that's pretty bad. It gets worse. We don't have those. The oldest manuscript copies to have survived date from the 15th century of the Common Era. 
after, over 1,500 years after they were originally written. There's a 1,500-year gap. But no one's saying we shouldn't use the Odorous if we want to narrate the life of Alexander. Think about Thucydides, and I see my friend Sterling, who's an expert on Thucydides. This is one of the most important works from classical antiquity. This is our, the source for what's called the Peloponnesian Wars between Athens and Sparta. And this is a fabulously important book that's still studied, and Dr. Sterling teaches it. Supposedly written around 400 BC, BCE, 400, somewhere around there. Great. Except that the printed text, which dates, of course, the, the printing postdates the printing press, comes from 1502, but that's based on manuscripts from the 11th century. So you've got a gap of more than uh, 1,400 years. And no one says, oh, we shouldn't read Thucydides. We study it and teach it. Now, we do have fragments. You know, in Egypt, in the 1800s, archaeologists came across a rubbish dump. This is a strange thing to talk about, a place called Oxyrhynchus. And they found all these old papers, thousands and thousands and thousands, mountains of it. And it was the repository of old discarded libraries of classical antiquity. And we found things that we didn't have copies of, all broken up bits and pieces. But we have them now. And for Thucydides, we have two small fragments of Thucydides that we can compare to the latest standard version. But even they date from 500 and 700 years after Thucydides. If you think about Sophocles, the copies of Sophocles that we have and use, and I, I started as a classicist, I love Sophocles, date from 1400 years after they were written. Plato, 14, uh, 1150 year gap. Aristotle, 1220 year gap from the time of writing to the oldest copies we have. Herodotus, 1300 years. Julius Caesar, 900 years. Tacitus, who wrote the famous Annals, the history of Rome. Again, two versions of it. One is 800 year gap and the other is 1300 year gap. And yet no one says there's a problem. No one would say, oh, we can't read Tacitus' Annals. As an undergraduate, I was made to read it. And I enjoyed it, by the way. So the Arabic versions, the Arabic books of Sarah that we have are far closer in time to these works of classical antiquity that we see no problems with. And this is actually just a small fragment of a contemporary version of Ibn Hisham's Sarah. And they frequently quote directly from earlier sources. Now, as I mentioned, the Sarah sources have inconsistencies. They draw upon different narrators, but they essentially present the same narrative of the life of our holy prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it's my judgment that actually for a major historical figure from antiquity, and he wasn't medieval, the, the prophet is a figure, bless him, peace be upon him, from antiquity, from the ancient world. His life is surprisingly well documented, surprisingly. But there's a problem with those sources, and this is just, I'm getting towards the end, thank you very much for being patient with me. The serious sources aren't history in the way that I would understand it. If I'm reading a book about uh, George Washington, or a book about Winston Churchill, I know that the scholar is trying to be objective, has looked at all the sources, looked at sources for and against. Uh, the Sierra sources, the books that we base our understanding of the life of a prophet, peace be upon him, are hagiographic. I mentioned it earlier, they make him as a saint. Everything that might be negative, we don't know, because it's been excised. Ibn Hisham tells us that when he redacted Ibn Ishaq, I took out everything that spoke badly of our prophet. He says he did it. 
And they are sacralizing. And sacralizing means everything is imbued with a religious dimension. Everything that happened, God did. And that's fine. Ultimately, I believe God did. But I also believe in human agency. And this is the part that I want to talk about. Hagiography is when we adulate or idolize someone, whether it's a religious saint, St. Augustine, whoever, uh, St. Francis, uh, Holy Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We find it hard to say anything but wonderful things because we see him as wonderful. Well, that's fine to a degree, to a degree. And when you look at those early works of Sira, the, the life story of our Holy Prophet, you see that they're not neutral. They're not objective history in a way that a historian would recognize. They're not at all. They have a very strong sacralizing tendency. Everything is imbued with a religious dimension. Everything is given a sacred character or quality. Now, you may say, well, I'm religious, so I believe all that. And of course, I'm also religious, and I believe all that. But I'm a historian, and I have a duty to, to try and say, what did these people actually do 1,400 years ago? What decisions did they take? How did that play out for them? And of course, there are stories of miracles and divine intervention, the Battle of Badr, our holy prophet, peace be upon him, stayed in a small hut made of uh, wood and prayed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent angels. And they fought those beastly Quraysh and helped to defeat them. Every Muslim knows that. Well, what did his a historian do when well, he's trying to tell a non-Muslim about the Battle of Badr? If I say, you know, that the prophet prayed and angels came, they'll say, well, you would say that. And I have no explanatory power. I have nothing I can say to that person that might reach the intellect. Nothing. And they give explanations, supernatural explanations for outcomes that might be explained differently by observers from outside that belief system. I'm from within it. And I do believe those stories. But as I said, I'm also a historian, so I'm caught in this dilemma of wanting something with meaningful explanatory power. That I can say, this happened in this fashion for these reasons, and there's human agency involved, because these are people that lived. And they made decisions for themselves. So this is how I respond to this. I have a bias towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad. I don't have a bias against him. I have a bias for him. Bias can be for or against. But I have an obligation to say, although he's my prophet and I have an affection for him, quite a profound one, obviously, I have to look at him as if he's Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great or any other historical fig figure in terms of my objectivity and the robustness of my interrogative uh, activity. I have to. And that's a challenge, you can imagine. But actually, it's really rewarding and immensely enjoyable. What I do is I, I deal with the supernatural parts of it by simply saying in my books, the Muslims at the Battle of Badr believe that the Prophet had called in angels. They believe that the angels had given them that support. Because that's what the sources say. I don't have to invest myself, I don't have to insert myself into my books by saying I believe it or disbelieve it. Why would I? Why would I intrude in my own books? I'm supposed to be an objective chronicler outside of that. And as I mentioned, it's my assumption that whether angels came or angels didn't come. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was granted human agency. He had the ability to act 
to react, to assess, and decide matters for himself. And those things had real-world consequences. And that's where my analytical focus should lie. So I believe the best thing I can do is analyze the participants' actions and consequences in their own right, without trying to either affirm or rebut any religious or supernatural claims. And the last point I want to make, and you've been terribly patient with me, is that everything has a context, which I've said several times. 7th century Arabia isn't like 21st century Abu Dhabi. It was a harsh climate, and I don't mean just the temperature. It was tribal in the Hejaz alone, which made up about 12% of the Arabian Peninsula. There were 60 tribes that competed continuously, seldom made alliances, constantly made war, and there was no overarching or centralized government, let alone law. War was the norm between humans in the ancient world. We live in a remarkable period for the first time in history where the default setting of human coexistence is peace. The world is at peace, alhamdulillah. Now you may say, not everywhere. Look at Ukraine, that's true. That's the exception to the rule at the moment. And there are other nasty hotspots that are unpleasant. But the world is at peace. And peace is expected of nations as they interact. It was not 1,400 years ago. It was very different. So I have to make sure I don't insert my present centeredness and try and cast the 7th century as I see the 21st century. That especially applies in terms of moral and behavioral norms. You read about things that existed Slavery, for example, in Arabia. We don't have slaves now. Thanks be to God. But slavery was part of every society in every part of the world 1,400 years ago, not just Arabia. That was a human norm, but now it's not. Thanks be to God. And we have modern analytical theories that we like to impose upon the past. We have theories, it used to be fashionable to have Marxist theories of economics or Marxist theories of state interactional development. Uh, Marxism has largely kind of faded away. Now we're in kind of this postmodern strange state where we still have theory and frameworks. And as a historian, as opposed to a political scientist, I tend not to like them. I like to just simply say that was the past, that's how it existed. That's what people believed they were doing. And the other thing that I find almost intolerable about people that try and talk about the life of our blessed prophet, peace be upon him, is that they use this kind of remarkable anachronism. They say, oh, the prophet set up a state. And he had a government. And had ministries. All this sort of mumbo jumbo. It, he didn't create a state of any kind. There was some type of kind of a loose proto-state that resembled the other Arabic tribes around. The difference being that genealogy wasn't the defining feature of membership, but confession, religious profession, defined membership of that thing we might call a kind of a super tribe. But it wasn't a state. And so I, I kind of have to avoid again that present centeredness. We always think of someone who's political as state building, because that's what it is now. But it wasn't 1,400 years ago. So keeping everything within context is immensely important, and removing them is dangerous. The other thing about it is that historians tend not to want to write lessons. Theologians write lessons. And much as I am religious, I'm not a theologian, I'm a historian. My job isn't to tell you what to believe or how to behave. And that's what sets me apart, I guess, from the traditional ulama that look back on the life of our prophet. They have a normative function. They're trying to create uh, expectations of future behavior. 
And that's important, but not to me, at least not for my scholarship. And I'm certainly not bold enough to say that what the Holy Prophet did or the people around him, um, peace be upon him, worked then so it still worked today. You have to be very bold to believe that humans haven't changed in 1400 years, that the human condition is identical. It doesn't mean I don't want to say things that are meaningful. But this brings me to the very last point before I close. And again, thank you for your patience. One of the things that bothers me most about the books of the books about our blessed prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that there's just a lack of logic in the way we approach uh, his life. He was an exceptional human, undoubtedly exceptional. I became a Muslim because I read his biography and thought, now that's a man I can follow. But that doesn't mean that the ordinary explanation for his success is one I can buy into, which goes like this. The prophet was a great leader because he was devout. He was honest. He was compassionate. He was tolerant. He was patient. He was fair. He was decisive and courageous. Am I disagreeing with that? No. He was those things. He was those things. They say that's what traditional, like the sealed nectar, I started off with that book at the beginning. They say that's what made the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a great leader, was that he had great character traits. In other words, because he was both a very good man and a very good leader, we have to deduce that he was a successful leader because he was a very good man. And that just doesn't make any sense at all. We lived, I lived, I was born in 1964. I was born less than 20 years after the death of Adolf Hitler. And Joseph Stalin had only died 11 years before my birth. I lived in the century of tyrants. And those tyrants were successful leaders, at least some of them. Thank God Hitler wasn't. Stalin held power for 30 years. He won a world war and changed his country from a backward, uh, non-industrial country to an advanced country. How can we say that Stalin wasn't a successful leader? But by, he, was, he was a wicked man, cruel and despotic. Yet he succeeded. So we can't simply say this. Look at Mao Zedong. Look at Napoleon. These were despotic humans. And yet they led well. Or at least they led effectively, meaning that they achieved their aims. And it's obviously true that a good person can be a good leader. But it's equally true that a bad person can be a good leader. Likewise, it's true that a good person can be a bad leader. And equally true that a bad, bad person actually is a bad leader. So much as I see in the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, remarkable character traits, and of course I do, they don't explain his leadership abilities. They simply don't. And this is my last slide. What the prophet actually did matters to me. What ideas he had about leadership, about the better future he projected for his people, his methods of achieving that better future, the behavior that he expected of others, those things matter. And we can build an analysis around that. So what are my conclusions, just to get to the end? I actually think that the books of Sarah and the Ahadith and our holy book are sufficiently broad, deep, and consistent for us to reconstruct the life of the holy prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he was a remarkably skilled leader. Now, I haven't gone into any details about his life. This is an epistemological lecture. It's talking about method. 
But please ask me, what did he do that was so good? You're taken by him. He was a skilled leader. He had remarkable aptitude, greatly intuitive. That thing that we call emotional intelligence today, he had it in spades. Talent, capacity, and remarkably, remarkable energy. And he died as an old man, age 62. Now, that doesn't sound terribly old. I'm 59 already. But 1,400 years ago, that was an old man. But he was an old man with boundless energy. Boundless energy. And this carried him and his vision to success. And he was visionary in the best sense of the word. He saw a better future and was able to take people on that journey towards it. He said, this is going to be hard. It's going to be risky. But you know what? You have a role to play in this because it's good for all of us, including good for you. And people believe that. And that constant inspiration touches me even now. And the other thing about the prophet, peace be upon him, is we shouldn't assume that everything he did, he did beautifully the first time he tried it. Some things he simply got better at. And he was a fast learner. And this, to me, is one of the hallmarks of human success and progress, is if we can learn from the things we do less well, how to do them better, and do them, and avoid the things that work less well, how quickly we can make change, as he did. Thank you. <laughs>